I'm surprised yet again at how popular one of my videos is. Thanks to a recent conversation I had in the comments with a YouTube user by the name of One Baptisma, I've decided to make a follow-up video to talk about a few things I neglected that he brought up, among other things. I recently finished reading the manga, at least the original Ghost in the Shell manga that the movie is based on. I have to say the movie is such a good adaptation that I think it's better than the manga and most people who like what it has to say should agree. The man most likely responsible is screenwriter Kazunori Ito, who would later go on to write the story of nearly all of the Dot .hack franchise's anime, games, and the movie. Dot .hack is a property I will definitely talk about at a later date, even if I do it indirectly. It's already been noted in many places that the tone of the movie is a lot more serious than the original manga, which, among other things, was lighthearted enough to have Motoko fantasizing about a lesbian orgy with her friends. I know I have to mention that or someone else is going to bring it up. But that and the tonal differences are not as interesting as a number of other things. The movie takes what was by far the most interesting aspect of the manga, the Puppet Master plot, which was originally split up, and expands it to include scenes and elements from the other plot lines, most of which didn't have a lot going on with them, as it was written mostly to be a kind of sci-fi police procedural. But watching the movie, you wouldn't know that, since it's a very well-done single story. The scenes that originally weren't relevant to the Puppet Master plot have been skillfully changed to fit it. At any rate, any program has its bugs, and I would think that a man of your capability could cure our problem. You don't understand. We aren't even if sure. You return. I'm warning you to watch your comments. Our country is a peace-loving democracy. Of course it is. In case you haven't been briefed, this is the minister's interpreter. Twenty-three minutes ago, her brain was hacked into through a data line. Foreign intelligence. Which reminds me, are you still using that revolver? You should stop worrying about the automatics jamming up. I like my Monteverd. <laughs> So what's the latest on your puppet master? He's only a puppet himself. What's a simulated experience again? Well, all your memories about your wife and daughter are false. They're like a dream. Someone's taken advantage of you. If this is all a lie, what happens? Will I get my old memory back? Your original memory will never be fully restored, and there might be residual simulation. It resembles the simulated ghost line that occurs when a real ghost is copied, but there's no evidence of the degradation that's usually incurred. In any case, we won't be sure until we chart the ghost sector and die. And can you offer me proof of your existence? How can you, when neither modern science nor philosophy can explain what life is? Who the hell is this? Okay, we're ready. It may not be much use, but I'll try to monitor your dive through this guy's brain. My code name is Project 2501. Industrial espionage and intelligence manipulation. I lack the most basic life processes inherent in all living organisms, reproducing and dying. But you can copy yourself. A copy is just an identical image. <sighs> And where does the newborn go from here? The net is vast and infinite. The lines in the movie that set up and develop Kusanagi's internal struggle with identity are original to the movie, and I'd consider them a stroke of genius. This includes her conversation about variation in the van, over-specialize and you breed in weakness. The late conversation with Bateau, including the puppet master's lines, I feel confined, only free to expand myself within boundaries. A bit of the lines in the elevator conversation on the significance of being human. What if a cyberbrain could possibly generate its own ghost, create a soul all by itself? And if it did, just what would be the importance of being human then? Some of the dialogue in the merge scene that involved identity. You're talking about redefining my identity. I want to guarantee that I can still be myself. And the lines Kusanagi quotes after the merge. Bateau, remember the words I spoke in another voice on the boat that night? 
I understand it now, and there are even more words that go with the passage. This also includes the lines that I mentioned in Part 1 that comment on the compatibility between the Puppet Master and Kusanagi. That robot, did we seem similar to you? Of course not. No, I don't mean physically. It's confirmed. No doubt, it's him. Him? Uh, the doctor is referring to the original pattern of the ghost line that's now in the body. He's simply speaking in generic terms. The sex of the perpetrator isn't known and remains undetermined. Why would Project 2501 run to Section 9? No one can be sure, but whatever the motive, or whatever's pushing him, there must surely be a reason. I don't know. Maybe he's got a girlfriend there he's got the hots for. Utter nonsense. Why did you pick me? Because we are more alike than you realize. We resemble each other's essence, mirror images of one another's psyche. In the manga, the conversation the Puppet Master has with Kusanagi right before the merge is also a lot more dense, and I think if anything it was improved in the transition to be more focused without losing any of the substance. There's a big difference between Kusanagi reacting to the merge in the manga with the thought of it being like multiple personalities, compared to her reacting with her thoughts and individuality. They were built up, and they play off the idea of the merge better. It's certainly an improvement. I'd like to stress that the mention of variation being useful in evolution and the merging with the AI being compared to merging with God were already in there in the original manga, but Ito very skillfully fleshed it out more by adding in Kusanagi's internal struggle about identity as a counterpoint, and adding the dialogue he did as well as the Bible verses. I regret not mentioning that they were Bible verses, as well as the angel being a reference to the Judeo-Christian religion. The lines the puppet master says to Kusanagi at the lake are from 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. What we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. And the lines Kusanagi then quotes in relation to her growth after the merge are from 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11. When I was a child, my speech, feelings, and thinking were all those of a child. Now that I am a man, I have no more use for childish ways. The use of these verses is to essentially build on what was only the angel symbolism in the manga. It's trying to say that Kusanagi merging with the AI is comparable to the idea of merging with God and becoming complete. If you look at the translation of the lyrics from the main theme, Makings of a Cyborg, although it's a Shinto spiritual meant to be a wedding song to dispel evil influences, there is reference to a God descending, though not a Christian reference. One Baptisma brought these things up, the Bible verses and the lyrics of the theme, to say that the movie deceives people. It, quote, turns the gospel of Jesus Christ to an improper use, end quote, and that it says technology itself is God, which as far as he's concerned is no God at all. I suppose if you're a religious fundamentalist, then yes, any use of the storytelling elements from your religion that you see as promoting something else would be blasphemy, but that's all I see them as, storytelling elements from a story, elements that, for that matter, were borrowed themselves and weren't original to Christianity. He uses a quote to imply that believing in technology is the same as worshipping it, which couldn't be further from the truth. Technology and science work and have long earned society's respect. That doesn't mean we worship it. I wouldn't say the movie itself idolizes technology, but it does compare an AI to God, and for all practical purposes, AIs will potentially far outclass us. I don't see any problem, then, in using a storytelling element to more accurately describe something that, at least more realistically speaking, will actually exist. One Baptisma also took issue with my statement that the Japanese have a good ability to accept other ideas. Most of the commenters tend not to agree with my statement either, though I wonder how much of that is a knee-jerk reaction. It's nice to see someone like Gaijin Goomba agreeing with me at least. Japan has problems with originality, but that being said, they can take literally anything and everything, change it and perfect it, and then call it their own. Let me give an example of how this is at play in Ghost in the Shell, specifically with souls. I should have explained a bit more of why I said the movie says there is no soul. If you considered that the movie says through the puppet master that human brain cells aren't required for consciousness, then, as per Kusanagi's lines, there's no real importance to being human. It's just a question of information, so the idea of souls is meaningless. And when I say soul, I mean the Western idea of the soul, as per Judeo-Christian belief, which says that only humans have immortal souls capable of union with the divine, and thus are capable of having consciousness. On the other hand, the beliefs of Japan and the original creator of Ghost in the Shell are different. From the author's notes of the Ghost in the Shell manga, personally, I think all things in nature have ghosts. This is a form of pantheism, and similar to ideas found in Shinto or among believers in the Manito. 
Just for reference, I should state that not all ghosts are the same in terms of complexity or effect. A true ghost is the higher level spirit attached to human bodies. In our story, the self that the puppet master refers to is an integration of information that has reached a specific level of complexity, shifted, and created a phase called life. I'd like to point out that he made reference to Manito, a spiritual belief held by a large group of Native Americans. I'm not gonna lie, he's more familiar with spiritual beliefs of the natives of my country than I am. Granted, he's not your average Japanese person at all, but stop and think. When was the last time you heard any American or Western media creator ever talk about the beliefs in their works in this kind of cross-cultural context? How often do you see Western properties use outside beliefs at all as anything other than maybe a gimmick? But the thing that's interesting is this kind of character for a female, you know, it's not every day you see it in the cinemas, all right, uh, female characters like this in Western movies. But that's not necessarily the case for Eastern movies, all right. Both Japan and Hong Kong have a strong tradition of not just female heroes, but female, you know, warriors, female avengers and that's what the bride is she's an avenger she's not and, a hero and you have that in crouching tiger hidden dragon as well you have you have it in there but in in china it even goes all the way back to folklore do not try and bend the spoon that's impossible instead only try to realize the truth what truth there is no spoon there is no spoon and when it comes to Ghost in the Shell's director, Mamoru Oshii, he said similar things, crediting his work to outside cultural influences. The ideas of using Bible verses and giving Kusanagi her internal struggle over identity in Ghost in the Shell are most likely to his credit, but I think Ito helped pick out the verses and had a larger part in shaping the overall adaptation. I'll explain my reasoning for that when I do my Ghost in the Shell 2 analysis. One baptisma here is condemning the movie for skillfully using outside culture, even while he argues they aren't very good at doing it. I find that a bit ironic. If you want to write a progressive science fiction story that tries to move the conversation forward on AI, Shiro's beliefs are very worthy of note too. If you believe only humans have souls, for example, it's implied you need one to have consciousness. And if you believe that, then if you were consistent, you'd have to believe machines can't think like people at all, just like the characters in the movie seem to think at first. But if you believe anything can have a soul or spirit, you're more likely to believe that the difference between humans and machines might just come down to a question of information and complexity. You'd be far more likely to accept that machines could think, and that the concept of only humans having immutable souls doesn't make sense, or even that the idea of the soul itself doesn't make sense in light of the evidence. Thanks for watching. It sounds to me like you're doubting your own ghost. What if a cyberbrain could possibly generate its own ghost, create a soul all by itself? And if it did, just what would be the importance of being human then?